The following program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. She's got the news. She talks with newsmakers. She encourages us to laugh. And she cries with us. Speaking truth to power and questioning authority daily, it's the Nicole Sandler Show. And it's a Thursday. Welcome to it. Uh, I am Nicole Sandler coming to you live from NicoleSandler.com, streaming out to a ton of different places from the Progressive Voices Network to uh, Facebook Live, Twitter, and Twitch. YouTube, eh, we're still suspended from live streaming, but the show does post there almost immediately once the live show ends. So if you like to watch on YouTube, you still can. It'll just be delayed by a little while. So today's Thursday. Thursdays, we usually have Howie Klein here, but not today because Howie is off getting his second um, uh, COVID vaccination because he's a responsible adult. I, I'm still in disbelief over all of the vaccine deniers, all, all, all the people who are just refuse to get one. You know what? Then stay away from me. You guys stay home now. We stayed home for the last year, 13 months or so. Now it's your turn. If you won't be responsible enough to get vaccinated, then you stay home and away from the rest of us. Okay? Then we can go about our business. But as long as you're going to be out on the street, we still need to wear masks. We still need to socially distance because we need to protect ourselves and everyone else against you. All right. Needed to get that out there. So that happened. Um, now, uh, Florida, you know, I, 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 I got to tell you the truth. We're actually thinking about leaving. Um, I, I have no love for Florida. My family moved here from New York when I was 11. And after college, because uh, I went to I went to high school down here in South Florida, went to the University of South Florida, which is not actually in South Florida, but in Tampa. And after that, I left. I went back to New York. I lived in New York for five years, and then I moved out to Los Angeles. I never thought I'd come back here because I, I aside from the weather and the beach, those are two things that I like about Florida. There's not much else. But I did come back. Timing, there was a lot of stuff going on. And long story. And we moved back just in time for my kid to start kindergarten. And now, you know, she's out of school. She's working. Uh, David and I are in this house that I've told you, we're, you know, we've been foreclosed on. Right now, we're supposed to, we, we're paid up uh, to stay here through the end of June we might be able to extend it a little further. So it all depends on what happens there. But then um, all bets are off. And now I'm watching this idiot DeSantis doing what he does. So this morning, he holds a, uh, a bill signing ceremony to sign this horrible SB90, which is the voter suppression legislation, uh, because he wants to be Georgia. And um, so it's held at a place. I don't even I don't even have the specifics in front of me because, frankly, it's not that important. But what happened was, um, you know, they, the, the the media, they they often send a pool reporter like all the, the different networks and cable channels work together in that sense where they share resources and. There's always a pool uh, reporter work or, and crew following the president because not everybody can be there. And so there was a CBS crew assigned to be the pool uh, re reporter, the pool crew, um, uh, to to cover this event this morning. Um, and they weren't allowed in. They didn't let any press in except for Fox. And it was sort of a like a... Um, a, a, a combined, it was a mashup, if you will, of uh, an interview on Fox and Fiends and Governor Death Sentence signing this horrific legislation that will curtail our voting rights. Um, you know, this place goes from bad to worse. He is just reprehensible. You know, he, he did away with all any any. COVID restrictions, no masks, and, and made it so that, you know, allegedly no city or town is able to put these restrictions in place. Well, a lot of towns are saying, 
you know, screw you to the governor um, and doing it anyway. Disney World is saying, don't tell us we have to let people in here with no regard for their safety. No, we're going to have our mask policy. We're going to have our social distancing policy. We'll do us. You do you. But I'll tell you something, with each passing day, as this state grows more and more batshit crazy, I want to be here less and less. Well, we've got a few, you know, in thinking about leaving Florida, there are, um, there, there are considerations. One is, neither one of us likes the cold weather, but I can handle it more than David can. He is allergic to the cold. I mean, when it gets below 70 here, he starts bitching about it. So... Arizona, he went to school at Arizona State, and David's son still lives, who also went to Arizona State, still lives out there. So we haven't seen Max in, I don't know, three, four years or something. Um, And so, you know, and one of my best friends from Los Angeles is now in the process of moving to to the Phoenix area. And I, I, you know, I brought it up. I said, you know, we have to leave this house. Why are we here in Florida? Now, that one thing keeping me here is my kid. Um, but I broached the subject with her and she said, go, if, if, the, if you find something, go, it'll give me an excuse to come out and visit you. And then hopefully she'd leave the state too. So anyway, it's an idea, but you know, these are our two choices, Florida and Arizona. I'd go back to California. I just can't afford it. It's just too damn expensive. So, but in Arizona, things there are just crazy too. Um, and, and, you know, they have this, uh, 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 fraud it going on, this alleged audit of their, of the election again. And it's, it's nonsense. It's bullshit. Um, this group, Cyber, Cyber Ninjas, who's doing the alleged audit, um, is, you know, they're, they're just a, a they're a, a nothing, a nothing, um, a, a company. They have no electoral, um, um, experience. This is not what they do, and their their practices. What they've done is they've everything is contaminated now because they've not followed the procedure. So there's a lawsuit being brought against them. The whole thing's a mess. But Phoenix is a mess. Anyway, I bring that up because today we're going to focus in on Arizona a little bit. You may recall the former sheriff of Maricopa County. Sheriff Joe Arpaio. I mean, he was fun to poke fun at from a distance. But make no mistake, this man was a tyrant. And he was sort of Donald Trump before Donald Trump. Well, for years, we covered when there was legislation brewing called, um, uh, you know, the, the euphemistically called the show us your papers uh, bill where you could be pulled over if the cop thought you looked like maybe you didn't belong there, like maybe you weren't a citizen, and they they could pull you over and ask for your uh, your papers, please. Um, so there's a new book that's out. It's called Driving While Brown: Sheriff Joe Arpaio versus the Latino Resistance, and it's a great story because um, young Latinos. B- bonded together to fight this kind of nonsense in Arizona, and they made the difference. They're the reason there are two, well, two senators with a D next to their names. I, you know, if we're talking about Kirsten Cinema and, uh, and um, Mark Kelly, uh, you know, I guess they're Democrats, but kind of, uh, sort of. But, but anyway, they're at least moving in the right direction in Arizona as opposed to Florida, which is moving from weird to batshit crazy. So anyway, in a few minutes, we're going to speak with the authors of the book, Terry Green Sterling and Jude Joffe Block. So anyway, that's going on in the back of my mind as we figure out. And right now, we're not going anywhere. I know 120 degrees is a bit much. I'm talking to Judith in, uh, on the Facebook, uh, watching on Facebook Live. Um, but here's the thing. They don't have humidity. 98 degrees in Florida with 100% humidity, that'll kill you. And that'll turn your brain to mush. I can deal with the dry heat a lot easier than I can deal with the humid heat. Anyway, and um, I kind of like it when it gets a little cold, right? Um, it does get cooler in the winter in the Phoenix area. Um, the, he doesn't like that, but I would 
because I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm over the heat, but I also don't like the freezing cold. So anyway, I know we're very demanding, aren't we? Um, now, now I'm torn. I've got two, two women who are pissing me off no end. On the one hand, you have Elise Stefanik who is a hypocrite to the nth degree. Um, This is the woman who the Republicans are going to put in as the number three in their House caucus. Uh, The party chair, I think they call it. It, it's It's a position really without any duties, but it's the number three in succession after the speaker and the, I think, the whip and then the then the caucus uh chair or whatever the title is anyway that's the the role they want to boot liz cheney from now again as i said yesterday and i've been saying i'm no fan of liz cheney's her i find her um her positions um insane i find her positions really reprehensible she's very right wing she's just not a trumper so she's she's a on a less she's on a you know the scale of heinous She's a few notches below Trump. And the fact that she's standing up to him when barely anybody else in the party will, she's risen a few notches in my book. I still don't like her. I don't trust her. Her policies are horrible, but I have more respect for her than I did before, which is easy because I had zero before. So now I've got a little bit. Anyway, they're booting her out of leadership. And they want to bring in this Elizabeth, this uh, uh, Elise Stefanik woman. And why? Because she's a Trumper. Like, um, here's the kind of shit that Elise Stefanik says. I guess I'm going with Elise Stefanik rather than the other reprehensible creature who I'll get to. But let's start with Elise Stefanik. So this is why, you know, Donald Trump likes her. And why does Donald Trump like her? Because she would do shit like this. I have an obligation to act on this matter if I believe there are serious questions with respect to the presidential election. I believe those questions exist. Tens of millions of Americans are rightly concerned that the 2020 election featured unprecedented voting irregularities, unconstitutional overreach by unelected state officials and judges ignoring state election laws, and a fundamental lack of ballot integrity and ballot security. Okay, nonsense, right? But you knew that. And then to make matters worse, because she's really sucking up to Trump, Erin um, Burnett last night on CNN pointed out that she has mastered the art of parroting whatever Trump says. When Trump attacked a Gold Star family during the 2016 campaign, Stefanik released a statement reading in part, I think there's no excuse to be attacking Gold Star families. When it came to Trump's foreign policy, Here's Stefanik again. This is October of 2016. His statements regarding NATO, his statements regarding Putin, uh, regarding some of the positions uh, in regards to Iraq that he made uh, regarding the oil fields. I absolutely oppose those. And after the infamous Access Hollywood tape, Stefanik released Uh a statement just days before the 2016 election. Donald Trump's inappropriate offensive comments are just wrong no matter when he said them or whatever the context. I mean, obviously, that was at the beginning. But even as, uh, you know, his his tenure went on, the former president described places like El Salvador, Haiti and Africa as bleep poll countries in 2018. There were plenty of Republicans at the time who tried to brush it under the rug as a joke and all that. I hear you, Lindsey Graham. Uh, but she released a statement saying, quote, Congresswoman Stefanik strongly believes the president's comments were wrong and contrary to our American ideals. OK, so you're thinking you hear that maybe this woman had some integrity. That was early on. Um <laughs> and then she saw the way uh, the the tides were turning within her party and she started, you know, pushing the big lie. And now we have this. The Democrats are obsessed with impeachment. They have been obsessed with impeachment. The phony Russia hoax. The phony Russia hoax oh, of Russia collusion. Sleepy Joe rejects the scientific approach in favor of locking all Americans in their basements for months on end. Joe Biden wants to keep them locked up in the basement. <laughs> you know, she doesn't have an original thought in her mind, but that's what they like. Apparently, she's Harvard educated, very bright. Um, worked for Mitt Romney, worked for um, a a number of sort of mainstream Republicans, and now she's gone full-on maggot, 
because she sees that's where her bread is buttered. And you know what? That's typical of these Republicans. That's how these radio people go. Sean Hannity? Sean Hannity... Well, probably believes what he's saying now because he said it over and over again. But, um, I, you know, I, I can't believe he was like that at the beginning. Or maybe he was. I don't know. So that's Elise Stefanik. My other heinous woman of the day award goes to Caitlyn Jenner. Oh, my God. So Caitlyn Jenner is running uh, in the recall election in California against Governor Gavin Newsom. Um, why? I don't know. Um, well, here's one. She she went on Sean Hannity's show last night because she's a maggot too. Go figure. And I just have to share a couple of clips with you because they, they are, are stunning. Stun- so, first of all, this one, um, I, I guess, see, see, Caitlyn Jenner's talking about her friends are leaving California. Why? Oh, well, there's a few reasons why. California. My friends are leaving California. Actually, they weren't my hanger. The guy across the hangar. He was packing up. Wait, the hangar where she keeps her private plane. So she's talking about her friend packing up his hangar. That he's talking about an airplane hangar. Okay, just in case you were wondering. Right over me, he was packing up his hangar. I said, where are you going? And he says, I'm moving to uh, Sedona, Arizona. I can't Sedona. take it here anymore. I can't walk down the streets and see the homeless. <laughs> I don't want to leave. Okay, <laughs> either I stay and fight or I get out of here. Oh, oh my God. God. So her friend, her other, her one of her private jet owning friends, can't take it anymore because he can't stand seeing all the homeless. Seriously? But wait, there's more. See how the vegetation is very, you know, it's not green. It's just because it just hasn't got much water. Uh Uh-oh. We are headed for a drought. Headed Um, for? That has to be looked at in advance. Okay. Here's my crazy thinking. Again. Okay. Oh, my God. Logical thinking. (laughs) We are now spending billions Uh of dollars. Yes. On this high-speed rail. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. They talk about it all the time between LA and San Francisco. And um, I'm going, why are we doing that? Really? Why? Uh, I can get on a plane at LAX and I'll be in San Francisco <laughs> in 50 minutes. <laughs> you know, why do we need high speed rail? Oh, why, why don't we do this? Why don't we invest that money? in desalinization plants desalinization along the coast. Desalinization plants. Take that water and any time it's a bad year, desalinate the water, have some pipes going over the mountains out to the San Joaquin Valley for all our farmers, have it down here. We're in the Camarillo area. You look right over here. I drive through the farmyards every year. Why don't we just start to look at it? Wait a second, maybe water is a bigger issue than trying to move a few people Believe it or not, Fast. 33 years ago when I started my radio career, oh, that was up. a big okay. issue in Santa Barbara. I, I don't care. So there she's like, we can fly. First of all, flying versus high-speed rail, a little worse for the planet, number one. Number two, not everybody has a private plane that they can hop in and fly up to San Francisco. And I'm sorry, it's just not green enough for her when she flies over the middle of the state. So we should... Uh, desalinate the seawater so you can have green fields? I, I don't know. But there's one more. She talked, she said that we're coming on a drought. So you remember Donald Trump, his advice, and he wanted to hold back disaster funds from California because of forest management practices. Well, Caitlyn Jenner apparently practices good forest management. It's away from them. They can't. You know. Would you allow controlled burns? Isn't there a science yes. behind forestry? Is that science <laughs> oh, being ignored in this state? Yes. Because when I watch it, it Management. my heart. I lived in Santa Barbara. I watched Hope Ranch, Hope Ranch burn down. Yeah, it happens. After I had just Climate left change. Yes. Um, Stop flying. Uh, yes, forest management is extremely important. Yeah. Rake! It, just like at you my house. Rake. And, and it's not even forest management at my house. The reason my house made it, because they say you have to keep any brush... 50 oh, or God. 75 feet. I think I had 75 okay. feet clearance. I, I, I'm <laughs> sorry. I, I just, I'm, I, I can't do this to you anymore. So that kind of had me a, a bit um, pissy this morning. Seriously? 
Unbelievable. And then you got Mitch McConnell, who said the quiet part out loud again. Now, he did it back in, what was it, like 2010, as we were coming up on the on the um, uh, 2012 elections. And when he said this. Our top political priority over the next two years should be to deny President Obama a second term. OK, so we learned. Right. That's when we knew. OK, so now we know what Mitch McConnell is. Well, he did it again yesterday. He did. One hundred percent of my focus is on stopping this new administration. Uh, 100% of his focus is on stopping the new administration. So then he's already said he will not work with the Democrats to do anything, get rid of the filibuster, and, and accomplish whatever we can to help the American people while we still can before they steal the next election. Oh, it's so frustrating. But anyway, so that those are the things that had me a bit frustrated today. So now let's find out a little bit more <laughs> about Arizona, shall we? Now, thankfully, Joe Arpaio is no longer a uh, sheriff there. Um, yeah, yeah, he was he was uh, uh, finally defeated in his insanity. But um, my guests today are two Arizona based journalists who join forces to tell the story of former Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio, and more importantly, the activists who took him on and led to um, and led the state on its transition from deep red to uh, almost blue. So Terry Green Sterling and Jude Joffe Block are the authors of Driving While Brown, Sheriff Joe Arpaio versus the Latino Resistance. And I figured we should start the story um, with uh, the story behind the book. <laughs> Whoops, uh, it would help if I did this. So, so this is a book um, about a powerful Arizona sheriff, um, and he's known throughout the world for his immigration crackdowns uh, in Maricopa County, Arizona, which is the largest, most populous county in Arizona, and um, the home to the Phoenix, Phoenix in the Phoenix metro area. So because um, Arpaio, uh, the sheriff's name is Joe Arpaio, and because he's, uh, he's, he's very, very famous for bullying his foes, bullying his political foes, retaliating against them with baseless investigations, um, he um, he has immense power at the height of his power, and no one stands up to him. And um, what it takes is a really fearless and very well organized Latino resistance to uh, to try to stop him on the streets, in the courts, in the public square, and in the voting booth. And this is basically what the book is about. Um, so the genesis for this book, uh, we both had been, you know, covering our pile for uh, different venues for a long time. And um, we met in 2012, in, which was two years after SB 1070 was passed, mm -hmm. the Show Me Your Papers law, yes. and decided to do a book because we both thought that this was a moment in history that, that should be recorded. Um, and it turned out to be a book for its time because it's uh, it's a story about a resistance to unconstitutional policing of people of color. Right. And so um, so Joe Arpaio was sheriff of Maricopa County for a, a ridiculous amount of time. What, it was like over 20 years, right? 24 years. Yeah. From he got elected in 1992. Wow. And then he was he finally um, was defeated in 2016. Um, he did run for sheriff um, in this last election cycle in, in 2020, but um, he did he lost the primary pretty narrowly, I should add, uh, to his chief deputy um, uh, and who, who was then defeated by the incumbent Democrat. Well, that's nice to know. And, and we're going to get back to the story, but just to, to put a happy ending on it, sort of. The work done by some of the activists that you write about in this book helped get him out of office. Not only that, helped turn Arizona 
uh, kind of blue because now they, Arizona's got two Democratic senators as of the last election. So, you know, some people talk about, oh, this happened overnight. No, it didn't. It was a lot of work by these activists, and they're the same ones that you write about in the book Driving While Brown. So before uh, SB 1070 that brought, I think, this problem into the national spotlight, Joe Arpaio was was um, wielding a very heavy stick in Arizona, right? I mean, we had all heard horror stories of how he would treat prisoners. Like, you have jails. Arizona gets very hot for part of the year. Um, he would keep prisoners outside in tents, make the men wear pink underwear, stuff like that. What were some of the most egregious stories about Joe Arpaio? Why did he come under so much scrutiny? He um, when he he really craves media attention, and um, he's a very uh, you know he's a he's a populist, and he likes to get word out to the people. At the time that he was elected. Arizona, like uh, um, other states in the nation, were experiencing a crime wave, and um, Arpaio's base, mainly, uh, you know, white Republicans, were terrified um, of of crime, of being victimized by crime. Many of them. So uh, he began to he campaigned on a anti-crime, keep you safe kind of ticket when he first got into office. And once he got into office, he, he as you said, he asked inmates to wear, he forced inmates to wear pink underwear, uh, removed condiments from, you know, from their trays unless they paid for them, uh, put them in tents. And all of this was, uh, you know, sort of theatrical, in my view, theatrical humiliation that got him more media. But there were other problems in his jails, uh, wrongful death lawsuits began coming out that uh, alleged uh, successfully with uh, that Arpaio's jails, people died in Arpaio's jails uh, from tasing or from being tied in restraint chairs. Wow. So there was a bit of controversy uh, in the, there was a lot of controversy in those early years, but Arpaio's theatrics with the pink underwear and the tent city jails tended to distract from that. Right. And so was there always pushback on him, like from the immigrant community, or did that happen as he got more, I don't know what the word is for him, uh, more um, more reprehensible in his behavior or as he, as he centered on immigration? Was he always that hard on immigration or did he morph into this notorious immigration enforcer? Yeah, it's a great question because he he did pivot into immigration enforcement and it wasn't part of his initial brand. Mm. Um, what happened was um, there was a growing movement in Arizona very concerned about illegal immigration. In 2005, a vigilante movement started patrolling the border. Um, they were known as the, the Minutemen. Um, and as, in that time when people became increasingly concerned about illegal immigration crossing the border and, and migrants being smuggled in through Maricopa County. That's when um, Arpaio wound up uh, following the people who would be in his base um, to that issue. And, and there were other politicians in Arizona who had already started to champion that issue and they had become popular for it. And and Arizona state legislature began to pass laws starting that went the first one that took effect in 2006. And Arpaio emerged as a very enthusiastic enforcer of that first law. And so that's really when we start to see his transformation. And he had started out as an ally in the Latino community. He'd been um, worked very well with the the, uh, the Mexican really? consulate in, in Phoenix and then later would have a very tense relationship. But there were people that in the early 2000s he, he was very friendly with who later became bitter enemies after he turned on immigration issues. Wow. So so he turned on immigration issues before Donald Trump came into power. Yes. Um, so that was his thing. And I guess it made them uh, bedfellows or something. How did how did Arpaio he uh, Arpaio famously was pardoned by Trump? What what was he pardoned for? What was his crime? 
Yeah, well, and a lot of people feel like um, Arpaio was Trump before Trump in many right. ways, in his political style. In, in they both also were believers in the false conspiracy about Barack Obama's President Barack Obama's birth certificate, as well as um, the immigration focusing on immigration enforcement. Um, so they had many things in common. Um, but uh, to get to your question about why did Sheriff Arpaio need a pardon, it all comes down to a class action racial profiling lawsuit that um, that Latino drivers and passengers filed against Arpaio. This lawsuit went back to, began in 2007. Wow. It's actually still going today. Um, this lawsuit alleged that his immigration enforcement tactics had racially profiled Latino drivers, including U.S. citizens. It also alleged that the that the immigration enforcement led to um, unconstitutional detentions. Um, and the judge found that immigrant that the sheriff's office was arresting immigrants who had not committed any crimes but just because they were they were suspected or it admitted they were undocumented. And the judge found that a local law enforcement agency should not be arresting immigrants just because of their immigration status. That should be the purview of the federal government. Right. He, in 20, 2011, as early as 2011, told Arpaio's office to stop arresting immigrants if they were not suspected of crimes. The uh, Arpaios did not implement this order. Um, it came out later that this order was ignored. It was never conveyed to deputies. Wow. And arrests of immigrants continued um, for about 17 or 18 months after that order came out. And so it was actually one of a number of things the judge found that Arpaio had done that violated court orders. And he basically the the Justice Department then prosecuted Arpaio for criminal contempt of court. And it, it was on the basis of those immigration arrests that happened uh, after the, the court had said they had to stop. And so in 2017, Arpaio was found guilty of the crime of a misdemeanor of criminal contempt of court. And he was going to face a sentencing for that um, but in the meantime, Trump intervened and pardoned him before that sentencing could take place. And it should be noted that Arpaio was one of the first people who endorsed Trump on wow. the campaign trail um, in very early 2016 and had stumped for him on the campaign trail, had spoken at the Republican National Convention. So these are two men who really helped each other at really critical moments and also had the, had very aligned priorities. Right, right. And it was after uh, his being found guilty and the pardon that he ran for re-election and lost. Do I have that right. timeline right? Um, That's right. He tried to have a political comeback. He first ran for a U.S. Senate seat in 2018 right. and then ran for his, his um, old seat in 2020 and um, both times was unsuccessful. And And what is Joe Arpaio doing today? Do we know? Um, well, he he's active. Um, he has an, an organization that a fundraising organization for law enforcement. Um, when I spoke to him last, he said he was going to start uh, selling pink underwear again, which oh, has been a major on. fundraiser of his um, in the past. He has his own book came out in October um, and he's been going to book signings and and promoting it. Amazing. It's the cult of personality and the same people who embrace Trump embrace him because they're the same uh, personality, you know, basis of the same personality, kind of both narcissistic and uh, megalomaniacs and all that. Um, so I'm curious about the two of you. I want to get to the activists and we will in a moment. But first, I want to talk to you guys. Terry Green Sterling and Jude Joffe Block. Um, how did you come together and, uh, and, and decide to do this project? Oh gosh. Well, it's it's a long long story. Um I I first wanted to write a sort of Robert Caro political biography of our pile uh in 2011 I shopped a book around New York um 
and was told that biographies didn't sell and the book was too regional. And I said, but wait, wait, this is this is a big story. This guy's about this local sheriff is enforcing immigration and all eyes of the world are on him. Um, but I couldn't convince them. And um, I, st I was writing, nevertheless, for uh, you know national newspapers and magazines about our pile and about um, his trials and his his issues with the courts over this racial profiling. And I met Jude um, in 2012, and we decided that at one point, you know, at some point in the future, we'd do a book on it. Um, we finally. Uh, signed a contract with the University of California Press four years later. And um, so it took us quite a while to write the book um, because it is, it is a book that is a very big book about um, unconstitutional policing, about a history of discrimination, about how movements build. And more importantly, um, it's a story about the people who lived through it. So, um, Anyway, that's our story. We um, that's how we met, and we were very determined to do this book, and we did. Can I just circle back a tiny bit to um, Trump and our pile? Sure. Um, the um, activists in the Latino movement in Arizona um, very you know picked up really soon that Joe Arpaio and Donald Trump were extremely similar, so similar that they call Trump the national Arpaio. And, um, you know, both of these guys had, you know, are pretty needy for attention. <laughs> and, yeah. um, you know, Arpaio said very early, you know, now that, that guy Trump, he's my hero. Um, which I found was odd because Arpaio was in his 80s and, you know, Trump was a much younger man. Trump, in turn, uh, studied our pile, and um, you know his. He he saw how um, misinformation, actually, about unauthorized immigration, uh, could really kindle and galvanize the base. Mm -hmm. And the, and our pile and Trump sought the same base. So um, so so our piles, our pile actually. One time I was covering a, a Trump rally and our pile, you know, would often introduce Trump or show up at the rallies. And he was always greeted as sort of this, you know, this godfather of restriction, restrictionist immigration movements. And um, at one point, a reporter asked our pile, so Joe, are you going to give any money to Trump? And Arpaio said something that struck me as very strange. He said, I'm not giving him any money. I'm giving him myself. So there was a fawnishness uh, between our Arpaio fawned on Trump, which I right. found fascinating. Because he, what, because he doesn't normally fawn over people because he expects them to come to him? Well, yeah. I mean, I'd never seen him fawn over anybody, and I'd covered him for, you know. Right many years and i found it interesting and that and, of course is the behavior that trump wants that that's what he demands of people around him i mean we saw it when he was in the white house and he they televised the the opening of his cabinet meetings and he'd make everyone go around the table to profess their love and admiration for dear leader so this is the way to trump's heart right to to fawn over him to praise him well it's also a way to arpaio's heart right so they're very much alike. Um, uh, it's it's an interesting dynamic when you get into the psychology of some of these uh, people who crave power, who thrive on it. Arpaio is certainly one of those. Now I want to talk about the other side. You you de you talk a lot about Arpaio in the book Driving While Brown, um, but but it's also a, a, a tale of the other side of the activists who took him on. Um, Again, if you just look at the big national stories, it seems like it happened overnight and all of a sudden Arizona is turning blue. Um, the fact is, these activists have been at it for a long time. Did it all start with fighting back against Joe Arpaio? It started no. a little before that. Um, and uh, I mean, as we chronicle in the book, there, there were earlier efforts to... Um, 
to crack down on immigration uh, or or kind of suggest an otherness sort of crack down on on make English language only um, right. policies and things like that over time in Arizona that galvanized this coalition into action. Um, but it but really what we show in the book is that um, the people who first came together and basically there's a coalition that forms in 2006 called Somos America and they they form in 2006 and that becomes the basis for the people who go on to fight Arpaio um, in the years that follow. But those people come to the coalition and they, they include day laborers, um, undocumented people, uh, people of Mexican descent who've been in there, whose families have been in Arizona for generations. Um, so it's a whole wide mix of people. But they um, what they all have in common is that they've either personally experienced discrimination in Arizona or or generationally their families have and um, and so they're they're coming with these long histories and we try to show that in the book that that for a lot of these these activists they're formed um, by experiences that happened for example in the 1930s um, Alfredo Gutierrez who who later became a state senator in Arizona and becomes part of this coalition, his father was deported as a U.S. citizen during um, during mass deportations in the 30s. So Alfredo grew up in the 1940s and 50s in a small mining town in Arizona with the understanding that being a U.S. born citizen might not protect you if there's a real crackdown on on immigrants and Mexicans. And this understanding of the interconnectedness between Mexican Americans and and, um, and recent immigrants and and then carries that with him throughout. Where And another activist we follow, Lydia Guzman, she came to Arizona from California where she'd been in part of the effort to fight against Proposition 187, which was a, a ballot initiative in uh, 1994 in California that would have um, restricted um, immigrants who did not have papers access to certain public benefits, including health care and public education. And she came from that fight and brought what she knew from that to Arizona. And so really the answer to your question is that there are there's a history in Arizona of immigration themed traffic stops mm -hmm. that make people of Mexican descent feel um, unwelcome and under suspicion. And there's a history of racism and discrimination against Mexican Americans and people of Mexican descent. And when Arpaio starts his crackdowns, people who have been reacting to those cycles of discrimination and that history are galvanized to respond. Right. And, and Lydia Guzman is a main uh, a character in your story. I hate to put it that way because this is a, a, this is a real life uh, reporting. These are not made up characters, but you do delve into her and what she went through in fighting Joe Arpaio. Um, where is she today? Lydia Guzman is uh, still an activist, and um, just very briefly, she she came from California. The she had been. Uh, she, she got her activist cred um, fighting uh, Prop 187 mm -hmm. that you just referenced in California, which was um, a nasty initiative uh, that went after um, uh, immigrants. Um, and she came to Arizona to be with her family. She brought her little kids right at the point that she came to Arizona and, and settled in Maricopa County, there had just been a, a massive raid in Chandler, Arizona, in which um, American citizens were ensnared um, because of the color of their skin. So she became, she immediately jumped into activism. And as Arpaio, uh, in the subsequent years, he had nothing to do with the raid that, that I just referenced. But in subsequent years, um, as Arpaio ramped up his activism, she ramped up hers. So mm -hmm. she's this courageous woman fighting um, this powerful sheriff with very little resources and lots of smarts. Um, she starts a hotline that's uh, funded um, 
uh, by allies. And um, this hotline serves as kind of a social services uh, network, but also as a way to um, look for potential plaintiffs um, in the racial profiling lawsuit. And um, she pays an enormously high price emotionally for her activism. First of all, she's out on the streets. She's watching parents being separated from their children. She's watching uh, the terror that Arpaio is causing the Latino community. And she sees it, uh, you know, every single day. And in the meantime, she's, She's having marital problems, hmm. financial problems because of her activism, right? Because she's so consumed by it. Her kids are, you know, angry. They're not getting enough attention. Um, ultimately, at the end of the book, I will tell you this, um, she prevails. She um, emerges victorious from all of these things that she's gone through and, you um, that's, that's, you know, she is the counterbalance to Joe Arpaio throughout this narrative. Wow. Now, things have changed. Obviously, the political climate in Arizona has changed. I, I don't know that you and you both of you live in Arizona, so you're better to uh, express where you are now, where the state is. I mentioned you've got two Democratic senators as <laughs> Republican leaning as they may be, Kirsten Cinema uh, is not exactly the most progressive, although she started as a progressive, which is weird. And Mark Kelly, who's who's pretty conservative as well. But this is a sea change from the bright red Arizona that it used to be. Um, do you see the shift in in the political uh, attitudes in Arizona moving in a more blue direction, or or is this an illusion that I'm seeing? I think it's really a mixed uh, a mixed bag right now. Um, so th uh, the legislature is still Republican controlled, um, and there's, I mean, I think that there's just a lot of diversity in Arizona, and it's it feels kind of like a place in transition, um, and that there's still um, there's kind of a sense of. Um, I mean, as, right now, as we speak, there's a an audit going on in Arizona, yeah, such as it is, because, right? Because um, the Republican-controlled Senate did not believe um, the election results or, or wanted to verify them through a third party, um, even after other checks had been done that that revealed no widespread ir irregularities. So, you know, Biden won this state by a very narrow margin. Not everyone here accepts those results. I think that. Um, what we have, we have a big redistricting fight ahead that actually Lydia Guzman, that's her next project. Um, so, you know, there are these factors that will help determine sort of how the balance of parties plays out here. But what's not going away is that there is a, a mobilized generation of people, people who grew up during Joe Arpaio's reign, um, who were compelled to become activists or run for office or um, become involved in politics and register other voters. And so we've seen this, um, this energy that was galvanized during the Arpaio era um, and how that is playing out in politics today. And so really what it means is that you have people in their, in their 20s um, and this includes dreamers as well, who've been very right. politically active in Arizona, even though they are not voters themselves, but who have already in their 20s and 30s um, have years and years and years of experience of political organizing. And um, and there's no sign of them going away. And so we, we do continue to have um, th this grassroots um, uh, effort that, that I imagine will keep going. But I, I think that there are real questions about while there there is a political appetite um, for change on the ground in Arizona, a lot of what's motivating it is is a desire for um, for certain policies that it might be hard for Democrats to actually deliver. Mm -hmm. And so, the one thing that really remains unseen is is kind of what happens if if those promises are never made. I'm thinking about immigration reform and other kinds of policies that that seem a bit elusive. 
Right. Well, and and that's sort of the case everywhere. You never know. And but we look. It looks like um, attitudes are changing. Right now, you still have a a Republican governor, and as you said, a Republican legislature. Um, but everything is is up in the air. And again, with these young, mostly Latino activists, the uh, the tides are turning there in Arizona. I do. I know. You know, one of my best friends from Los Angeles is just moving there, and now I live in South Florida, which is going further. You know, crazy right. And we're actually talking about maybe coming to Arizona. My husband graduated from ASU. Uh, Terry, I see you're with Arizona State. Um, right. uh, and uh, his son lives there. So it's a reason to go. And and again, thinking of uh, getting out of the state that's governed by the guy that I call uh, death sentence, DeSantis, because of his policies. Um, it, 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 you know, there seems to be a, maybe a movement towards uh, moving towards Arizona thinking that it may go more blue I guess that's up to the electorate what what is the status of SB 1070 does this show us your papers law still exist is it in, in effect it is technically in effect um, it's been um, there was the Attorney General in 2016 signed a settlement agreement with some of the parties that had sued over it, uh -huh. where basically he issued a guidance to law enforcement about sort of constraining how the remaining provisions of it could be enforced. And so under SB 1070, the guidance for local law enforcement is that if they suspect, if they see someone that they suspect is undocumented and, um, they are supposed to ask about the status, but they are not supposed to detain that person um, longer than they're not supposed to continue the de detaining the person and holding them unless there's a suspicion that a crime has taken place. So in terms of um, in terms of it being used as a tool to arrest undocumented immigrants who have not been suspected of crimes, that part of it was supposed to be neutralized. Now, uh, there is still a question about how, how local law enforcement is, is using um, that guidance and what is actually happening on the ground, but that, that is the current status. And even before that, the Supreme Court had struck down a lot of it. And so we're talking about what was left um, in effect. Yeah. And, and, and can I just add you, you wanted to, you asked about, you know, Arizona turning blue, mm -hmm. um, just to piggyback a little bit on, on Jude's wonderful, um, thoughts. Um, I feel, you know, that Arizona is on the sort of on the precipice and, and could go either way. Mm -hmm. And I feel that way strongly about the rest of the nation. I mean, yes. um, this, this ballot count is unprecedented and um, full of, you know, people are asking a lot of questions about uh, where it will take us. And um, I'm thinking that, you know, we're just like the rest of the nation because we're sort of teetering between, you know, one political viewpoint and the other. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's a very dangerous place right now um, and a very risky place. But uh, the difference the difference between Arizona and um, other states is that we have this uh, unique and vibrant um, resistance uh, that started, you know, started, the Latino resistance started really in 1848 when, um, you, you know, Arizona was annexed after the Mexican-American War. It was annexed into the United States and there's been discrimination and this resistance has built on, on the hearts and souls and battles of, you know, previous Latino resistances. So it's very well seasoned and, um, you know, I think it's a national model really. Um, for uh, for a modern resistance to civil rights abuses. So that's the one thing that we have in Arizona. We also have this powerful indigenous vote that can't be discounted. Um, and so we have those two things really that kind of separate us from the rest of the nation. And it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. 
Uh, one last thing I want to bring up, because you did mention the recount, or as some people I know are calling it, the fraud it. Uh, it right. is, you know, there were recounts done. There were official um, recounts done according to the laws of that govern elections. This is some group, I think from Florida, called Cyber Ninjas, who have no electoral experience. They were plucked out of obscurity by, uh, I guess, the Arizona Republican Party and hired to do this. The people that they've hired, we know at least one person who's in there allegedly counting, took Part in the uh, January 6th insurrection at the Capitol, um, we know that on the very first day, they had blue pens available to the alleged counters. Um, blue pens can change the ballots and can be read by the computer. So it was tainted from the start. This is a charade. And where, where do they hope to go with this? They think this is going to overturn the Arizona election results. Who would certify that? So at the very least, I mean, we don't know where it's going to go, right? We know it's setting a precedent um, for future recounts of this sort, um, but we don't know where it's going to go. Uh, we do have um, the, the head of the Democratic Party in Arizona is Raquel Teran, and she is um, grew up in the resistance. I mean, she got her cut her political teeth in the resistance. So it will be interesting to see the legal challenges that that may happen um, coming from the Arizona Democratic Party. But um, I mean, what concerns me personally is just the precedent setting. Right. No, me too. Um, the right. fact that they can do this and there's no legitimacy behind it. And, right. and the Republican Party from Trump on down uh, this uh, and again we're in such a weird political time that the guy who was defeated for re-election for president um, who also I guess presided over the loss of the Senate and didn't win the House um, is still the titular head of the Republican Party this is unheard of before and everybody you know uh, we're looking at what's happening to Liz Cheney dare to criticize your leader and you're drummed out of your position in leadership and probably drummed out of Congress as well. This is a dangerous place to be. And the fact that this might be a precedent in terms of uh, they're looking at it as the first step in, again, trying to overturn the 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 certified election of, of November 2020, I find astounding and, yes, very dangerous. So we're in a strange, strange place, even though it seems like we're, we're kind of lulled into some sort of um, comfort where I know I felt a huge weight lifted off my shoulders once Trump was out of the White House. Um, I guess this is a warning. Don't be so complacent. Right. And, and what the, the resistance, the, the men and women who are um, central to our book, what they say is always be vigilant and resistance is a long game. You get one victory, but that doesn't mean, you know, that the battle is over. Right. Um, the book is Driving While Brown, Sheriff Joe Arpaio versus the Latino Resistance. Uh, the authors, Terry Green Sterling and Jude Joffe Block. Thank you so much for joining us today. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you for writing this book. It's really important. Thanks. Thank you for having us. Uh, there you have it. Um, uh, again, a fascinating story. That, and that it could happen, that, that this happens in the United States, that somebody like Joe Arpaio could ro rise to power and and rule with an iron fist over that county for tw what did they say 27 years that's insane and uh you know he look he could have easily been elected to the senate and the fact is you know he he is a he's a trumper and that and that donald trump is um you know, uh, pardoned him. It tells you everything. And the fact that Donald Trump is now, um, you know, again, running the Republican Party. They had a window there after January 6th when Kevin McCarthy got up on the House floor and said he's responsible when Lindsey Graham said it from the Senate. I'm done. I'm done. I've had it. I've been there with him and I'm just done. Until the next day when he was again kissing his ass down in Mar-a-Lago. It, it just, 
I, I know I talk about opposite world all the time, but that's where we are. And it's scary. And the fact that, you know, another Trump wannabe Ron death sentence is literally being touted as the the 2024 Republican nominee if Trump doesn't run again. What are we missing here? The only thing that, that gives me any hope is knowing that we will come out in in masses, I think even more than we did last November, to to prevent him from getting back in office again, because we've been there and done that. We don't want to do that again. <sighs> All right. Um, tomorrow on the program, Stephanie Kelton it, it will be here. And I'm so excited because with all the talk about how are we going to pay for it? And then Joe Biden today says, I'm not going to deficit spend. Oy. Somebody sent him a copy of The Deficit Myth, please. Stephanie Kelton's book. Well, she'll be here tomorrow, as will uh, I and hopefully you. Thank you for listening, everybody. Uh, until tomorrow, stay safe. And if you haven't yet, get vaccinated. All right. Thanks for listening. For Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. Facebook's Oversight Board on Wednesday upheld the social network suspension of the former guy, saying that when the suspension was imposed, there was a, quote, clear, immediate risk of harm by Trump posts legitimizing the January 6th mob attack on the Capitol. The 20 member board said in a statement that Trump created an environment where a serious risk of violence was possible. And that's what led to the ban following the insurrection. The board added, though, that it was, quote, not appropriate for Facebook to indefinitely suspend Trump because it's not permissible for Facebook to keep a user off the platform for an undefined period with no criteria for when or whether the account will be restored. So the board called for Facebook to re-examine the, quote, arbitrary penalty it imposed and decide on a, quote, appropriate penalty within six months. Of course, Trump and other Republicans expressed outrage that the board didn't lift the ban immediately. A new report released by the CDC Wednesday predicts that the U.S. toll from COVID-19 will fall sharply by the end of July. But they warned that there could be a substantial increase if unvaccinated people don't continue taking basic precautions like wearing masks. The paper said that even if slowing vaccination rates reach disappointing levels, new infections, hospitalizations and deaths should still drop significantly through July and keep falling after that. CDC director Dr. Rochelle Walensky said we're not out of the woods yet, but we could be very close. And then she acknowledged that the new highly infectious variants were a, quote, wild card. Speaking of the variants, there's some encouraging news, this time from Moderna, with two announcements Wednesday. First, the COVID-19 vaccine they announced as 96% effective in children aged 12 to 17. And the second point is that data from an ongoing phase two clinical trial indicates that their vaccine booster proved effective against both the South Africa and Brazil variants. A 50 microgram dose administered to previously vaccinated trial participants increased the immune response against the original virus as well as the variants. Moderna also said that the side effects from the booster appeared similar to those people reported after the second dose of the vaccine, including arm, muscle and joint pain and fatigue. Well, the Biden administration announced Wednesday that it does support a waiver of intellectual property protections for COVID-19 vaccine patents and will advocate lifting them in discussions with the World Trade Organization. U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai explained that the administration, quote, strongly believes in the protections, but considers the waiver necessary so that other countries, especially those experiencing a surge in infections like India, can ramp up their vaccine vaccination programs. The White House has faced pressure to support the waiver, but critics argue that it's too risky and that it wouldn't actually increase global vaccine distribution. 
Pfizer and Moderna shares plunged after the announcement. So, could this finally be the end of Bibi's reign in Israel? After Netanyahu failed to put together a government before Tuesday's deadline, Israeli President Rivlin on Wednesday asked centrist opposition leader Yair Lapid to try. Lapid now has 28 days to piece together a coalition with a majority in the 12-seat parliament known as the Knesset. If he also fails, Israel could head back to the ballot box this summer for its fifth general election in just over two years. In the meantime, Netanyahu will remain as a caretaker prime minister. Lapid ran on a promise to strengthen checks and balances in the country's government and to prevent Netanyahu from retaining power, saying, quote, after two years of political paralysis, Israeli society is hurting. A unity government isn't a compromise or a last resort. It's a goal. It's what we need. Well, the U.S. District Court Judge Dabney Friedrich, a Donald Trump appointee, on Wednesday struck down the nationwide eviction freeze that federal authorities had imposed to help renters avoid losing their homes during the pandemic. The judge saying, quote, the question for the court is a narrow one. Does the Public Health Service Act grant the CDC the legal authority to impose a nationwide eviction moratorium? It does not. The CARES Act, passed in March of 2020 as the pandemic just hit the U.S., established a 120-day eviction moratorium. Trump had extended it with an executive order in August, citing the danger that evictions could force people into shelters or other crowded places where the virus could spread spread. It's unclear as to when evictions will start up again. Well, the Justice Department Civil Rights Division sent a letter to Arizona Senate President Karen Fan on Wednesday detailing concerns about private contractors auditing the November presidential election in Maricopa County. Last month, the Republican-controlled Senate used subpoenas to get the 2.1 million ballots cast there during the election, as well as voting machines and private and public voter information. But in the letter... A DOJ Civil Rights Division official said that the department is concerned about reports that the ballots, voting machines and voting information are not secure and could be lost, stolen, altered, compromised or destroyed. And that an audit firm's plan to contact voters by phone to ask whether they cast a ballot could be seen as voter intimidation. The governor of the ironically nicknamed Sunshine State signed new restrictive voting legislation into law Thursday morning, but refused to allow in any press other than Fox. Not even the CBS poll camera that was assigned to feed the event to news outlets around the country was allowed in. Instead, they told everyone that Fox had an exclusive on a bill signing. Okay. And finally, from the Republicans' bipartisanship files, Mitch McConnell just never learns. After his 2012 priority failed... Our top political priority over the next two years should be to deny President Obama a second term. Yeah, you remember that, right? Oops, he did it again. And by saying the quiet part out loud, McConnell maybe gave the Democrats the ammo necessary to go it alone. 100% of my focus is on stopping this new administration. And that's how the Republicans practice bipartisanship. I got the news. And that's just a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and the Nicole Sandler show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener supported and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com and please click on that donate button.